everybody, welcome back to another episode of Card Talk, a podcast where we spend just a little bit of time talking about cards from Lord of the Rings Card Game. Uh, I'm your host, Dave Walsh. And I'm your other host, Ted Bannock. And I love talking about cards. Is that true, Ted? It is. It is a very true statement. <laughs> it's a statement of fact. <laughs> and uh, we got lots of cards to talk about, and that's why I'm excited to be on this show. Yes, yes. Is there anything else you get excited to talk about? Um. Well, I'm not excited that Grant's not here. Poor, poor guy. He's not along for the ride today. He is not so along he, for the ride. He will be missed, but we'll we'll pay a little homage to him uh, in this episode. Yes, definitely homage, which begins with an H. And I am also excited, David, to be talking about our esteemed and beloved patrons. I know the patrons are amazing, right? And so it's without without support from the fans and the patrons, the show would not be what it is today. So uh, there's proof. Just go back and watch some of the early episodes. You'll see what the patrons have turned the show into. So um, without any further ado, I would love to thank Edmund, Peter, Joe, Niall. I did get confirmation from Niall that that's how you pronounce his name. Hey. Uh, Carl, <laughs> Carl Vardain, James, Jake, Joshua, Matt, Russ, Justin, Jason, Kyle, Daniel, Mike, Robert, David, Sean, Lou, <laughs> Phil, Joseph, and Dominic. Wow. So those are all our patrons. And we have two, Edmund and Peter, who joined this month uh, new. And just so everybody knows, uh, we usually record a big chunk of shows together. So if you haven't heard your name um, because you are a patron and you just became a patron, don't worry. Um, we will make sure that you will get your name in the show very shortly. So, um, And Edmund... I met Edmund at Con of the Rings last year. We played Nightmare something from Kaza Doom and lost in like the first 30 seconds and then reset and then played again. <laughs> Did a little bit better, but still lost. So Edmund, thank you for joining us. Um, it's uh, it's always a pleasure to, to have people I know join the ranks of patrons. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited. We're, you know, we're recording a whole lot of episodes um, in the in the 2020 quarantine here, but uh, I'll be really excited when conventions are a thing again. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to play live with with uh, some people in Minnesota at the FFG Center. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, it'll be nice to get into swing with uh, um, Con of the Rings, Gen Con, uh, fellowship events and right. And get out there with the rest of the players. I know. Well, let's, I guess we should probably talk a little bit about today's card, right? Should we introduce it? I'm, I'll, I'll say, I'll put, I'll put Grant's business out there. Grant, Grant couldn't join us tonight. So we're just going to record this as a one-off show, but he had a tooth pulled and so he can't really talk very well. So, you know, when you get your teeth pulled, your cheeks swell up and it's, it's all a big, big mess and it makes it really hard to eat, right? You can't shove your face full of food. And so, um, in honor of, of Grant getting his tooth pulled, which is a weird thing to be honored for. I know, but it's Grant and we honor him any way that we can. We decided that we were going to do Cram. So, Ted, why don't you read down through what Cram is? All right. Today's, uh, today's card talk card is Cram. Cram is a zero-cost leadership attachment. It has the uh, uh, trait of item. It reads, attach to a hero. Action. Discard Cram to ready attached hero. <laughs> Just get into it, Ted. What do you think of this card? Cram is, it's, so it's an action. I love it. That's just, that's it. I love it. I think it's a great card. Okay. It's, it's a ready on your hero for no cost. It's only, it's got a couple weaknesses. Uh, the weakness that it's um, an attachment. So you can only play it at, during the planning phase. Right. You know, some events that ready your heroes have a cost. A lot of them cost one, but mm -hmm. then you can play that at action speed. Um, and this, you kind of, you can, any hero, any hero on the board for zero. Yeah. And so this, I mean, 
before I talk a little bit about my opinion, this brings up that whole argument that I've had about zero cost cards and, you know, are, you know, are they worth putting zero cost cards in your deck if they're good enough? Like, do the, does that, is it a free card? You know, and so some people will say that it's a, it's a free card, but it costs deck space. And so then deck space means that you're not getting to other cards that you may need in other, you know, like more quickly or whatever. So, you know, that means that if you put three copies of cram in a deck and you're a 50 card purist, you're down to 47 cards, other cards. So you, so zero cost cards always bring up an interesting discussion. Now I fall more on the side that, you know, I'm not, I'm not married to the 50 to the 50 card deck, uh, restriction that I can have more than 50 cards of the deck. And I think in certain decks cram for zero cost just makes a lot of sense. And I'm willing to keep that in my deck and expand my deck even, um, to have that zero cost card, you know, cause you can, you can draw it and play it almost right away, you know, like, and that's important and it's not now I'll get a little bit into it, but it's, it's not trait restricted. Um, it's not like Lembas, which is, which is, um, trait restricted the only thing that's restrictive about it is they have to put it on a hero so ted i'd be interested um before i talk about how i use this card to hear what you think about zero cost cards being free except for deck deck yeah. space yeah right that's an interesting argument that you bring up that the zero cost cards have a hidden cost of like is the benefit of the card you know worth worth the deck space and is it worth you know, if, if you if you're in a tight situation and you're trying to find something in your deck to help you through a scenario, and some players like I use Glyowin and I let you draw a card, and then you pick up a cram, <laughs> like a zero cost card that doesn't have much impact, um, you know, are you you're really not better off, right? It could have been something else to help you, right? Um, I don't believe in that though. Like, I think that, like, I mean, I believe in it to the extent that that sort of thing happens. But I think that, you know, if you need readying in your hand or in your deck, you know, I think that cram is an option. And I don't necessarily think that you need to. I, I don't, I don't know how strongly the zero cost card in your well, deck is a cost, I guess. Boots from Erebor was where we had this, like, the original boots from Erebor like episode uh, I alluded to an episode way back then go back listen to the boots from Erebor episode uh, trust me four episodes in it's great <laughs> <laughs> but anyway you know like I mean but that's where this argument where I first vocalized this argument like it's free and then people are like no it costs a deck spot but I'm like it's free you you, you draw it you put it into play and it's perfect like there's no reason to not put it in a hobbit deck but i don't know yeah uh well so i'll, I'll bring up um i don't think that's quite the case i see <laughs> i see the argument for it but zero cost cards also have a hidden a hidden benefit of being zero cost um there are so first of all for this being a zero cost attachment there are plenty of effects in the game uh via treachery and shadow cards that will force a player to discard an attachment of their choice. Right. And if I have to choose between any attachment I've paid resources for versus a zero cost cram, I'll lose cram. <laughs> I didn't pay any resources for it. Right. I'm not any really worse off other than the fact that I'm down a card, but you know, it's, it's, it's makes that loss a little easier to swallow. Right. And uh, secondly, too, there are a few mechanics in the game that will force you to discard the top card of your deck and then do something based on the cost of the, the of that card that you flip over. Right. Um, a couple encounter cards that come to mind are Goblin Town Scavengers. Right. Um, from on the core set, they have their threat increased. Right, and then the Hobgoblin from the Arid Mithrin cycle, you pull a card a over card. and you add it over, right? Yeah, right? right. So if you if you get you you pull over this cram, 
that Hobgoblin gets plus zero to all of his stats. Right. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, I get, I, let me, let me first, you know, there's people screaming at their radio or at YouTube right now, but you know, the, I get that there's a cost that this has to go in your deck and you're diluting your deck if you're using this because, you know, like I get that. But I guess what I'm saying is that when you're building a deck, I don't know how important it is except that moment that it's super important. And in that point, you may be <laughs> losing anyways. You know, like if you're if you have 49 threat and you need to draw that one card to reduce your threat and you're like, it's got to be there and you draw a cram, you're going to be grumpy. <laughs> right. But it doesn't matter what that card is if it's not a threat reduction card because you're right like you know what i'm saying so like that argument i understand you know like i'm a high school chemistry teacher i teach all you know i i'm very good at understanding the math of that but i think that you know the zero cost their free cards is like i don't know i just i you know i think this card is a very good card to ready like I don't know. Maybe we yeah. can be a little bit different on our opinions about this. There's yeah, also well, keep in mind that there also is um, recently there's the these characters do not um, ready until the end of the turn or cannot ready until the end of the turn. So remember that cannot word is is absolute. Nothing can override cannot in, in the encounter deck. So if it cannot ready until the end of the turn, that means that you miss the refresh phase. And so cram is a great way to think about getting around that cannot ready until the end of the turn, because then you can, if you have cram on a hero, then you can ready that hero during the next turn. So there's a good segue into like how to use this card effectively if you need to. Um, yeah. So let's just talk about the actual benefits. Um, I mean, this is, this is a readying your hero for one. And as soon as, as soon as you draw it, most of the time you're going to play it. There's going to be very few times that you, when you draw it during the planning phase, uh, you know, or before the planning phase that you're going to just put it into play because it doesn't cost anything. Right. And I'd say the, the best use cases I typically uh, use it for is I put it on a character who is a defender. He's either a primary defender or can be a defender in a pinch situation because that's usually when you need the action. Right. At least for me, I, I you know, uh, enemies, their shadow cards make them do extra attacks. Treachery cards make them do extra attacks. And then I'm sure glad that I have a cram on my whatever version of Aragon. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, a shadow card makes an extra attack. Okay, great. Already Baragon and defend it. Right. Problem solved. Yeah, I find myself, um, I have a couple of situations where I use cram. Um, first of all, to have a zero cost ready. I mean, I know that it's a one off, so that makes it, you know, it makes it a little less. It's not like an unexpected courage, right? If you had a choice between playing a zero cost cram or a two cost unexpected courage, I think you're always going to go to the unexpected courage because it's a it's a permanent always. condition. You know, like, I mean, the only reason why you wouldn't play the cram is because you don't have a I don't know why you wouldn't play the cram immediately you know like I don't know if you you know like you're gonna put both unexpected courage and cram down in the same turn you know but I think that um I think that early game I think you're right so in the in the first round if you get a, a cram or even two crams in your hand I think that you keep it I think you keep that hand a lot of times people don't want to keep a hand if they have two or duplicates of each other. So they'll take a mulligan. Like if you have two, uh, uh, two unique allies, two, uh, two tree beards or something like that, you know, like, sure. You know, but I think that, um, if you have two crams, having two crams in your hand early on for exactly what you said to defend is great. But I think as the game progresses, not the game, over the lifetime of the game over nine years. But as you play as your scenario, as the scenario, as you progress through the scenario, you know, when you get to mid game, I think that cram can be used all around to, you know, to be able to get multiple actions out of somebody. I use cram very, very amazingly um, in my um, K 
kids gather around the Christmas tree deck, which was inspired by last Christmas's episode on Treebeard, right? And so, yeah. you know, like <laughs> I have, uh, I use Frodo and Treebeard um, and who's my third, I don't know, third hobbit. Must be Bilbo. So, uh, but the point is, is that, um, you know, like I'm able to ready Treebeard and and by putting cram on tree beard and then i'm um so tree beard can then defend a couple of times like you suggest is important early on but then you know by mid game tree beard is really good at questing and then defending or questing and then attacking after i have my my defending figured out and so like the the idea of a zero cost ready is is crazy good f- in that scenario i've also recently developed um a (laughs) a a guaihir deck and i think i call it um uh who is it it's a guaihir uh hero guaihir tactics aimer and um frodo yes and frodo okay so again i'm using the hobbit but um and so it's a it's a leadership frodo so you know i'm trying to get the ready but that cram that goes on guai here because guai here doesn't ready during the refresh phase is also really nice because guai here has stats all the way around so again you can use it to to defend but i think later on in the game late game i think it just becomes super flexible um and you're never going to go wrong putting it on the defender but i think that you know, late game, mid to late game, you have a lot of choices. And I think that Cram can help in those, with those uh, late game pushes, whether it's, you know, I want to quest for a whole bunch and I need an extra two because Gwai here quests for two and I won't be able to ready him. But, oh, wait, I have Cram on him. So I'll quest with Gwai here and then ready him. And then I'll have his attack, you know, Eagles of the Misty Mountain or what's the one that throws the, throws the, eagle stats to um flight of the eagles or whatever not flight of the eagles that's the one that pulls it out of the encounter deck. Name support of the eagles support of the eagles that's it you know like okay. you know but that's the thing right you can you can do all sorts of crazy things so that's where i i have a tendency to use cram is you know and and there's sometimes when i play cram and i never i never need to ready a character like i'll put it out in the first first turn but when you need to ready somebody you really need to ready somebody (laughs) you know like and that's the cool thing so you know i may get i may get two copies of cram in my opening hand especially playing that kids gather around the christmas tree um and you know i'll use both of them in the first round because i'll get a bad draw and you know like a surge and i have two enemies and i need to defend both you know so i don't know so I think Cram is a really great card. Like, I think it's just a really good card to have, you know, for zero cost. It's a free card. You might as well just include it in all your decks. Yeah. If you have the, the card draw to support it. And um, uh, those are really, those are really great points. I think you can put it in even having extra attack, just an extra action on your hero is valuable. So to get that for zero cost, um, I think is really, is, is certainly worth it. And uh, there's also a couple of heroes that also have actions in the game, um, such as uh, Barivor, for example, who right. lets you target a player to draw two cards. Early on, that could let you quest with Barivor for two and then ready here with the cram and then just draw two more cards and then you're still up a card. Or target another player who's starving for those cards. Uh, same goes for Galadriel. And, um, well, here is a great example, too, because... It's like a backup card. It's like, okay, right. what if I can't trigger Gwahir's ability? Right. What if I don't have Willy Door or something that's going in and out of play? You know, so, you know, it's, right. uh, it's um, awesome. Yeah. So having that backup ready in a pinch um, is really great. And I think I'll just, I'll make the other mention of it too. It is an item attachment. So if you are playing Bard, Son of Bane, uh, the spirit hero, he can play this in his deck regardless of what spears you're playing so you got a mono spirit deck with bard 
you can pack in some crams if you want, because he's uh, a traitor from Dale. <laughs> right, and actually that's super thematic because that's where cram- the lore of cram is that it's like a, it was, it was, a, I don't want to say it was, it was like Lembus, but it was, it's similar to Lembus because um, it was a whey bread that was used by, uh, that was made by the men of Lake Town and Dale when it was there, Eskaroth, right? And, right. Um, uh, well, well, Dale. What's that? Uh, uh, go ahead and uh, finish. I was going to read the flavor text, but why don't you go ahead Oh, yeah. And then, at, uh, and so, you know, like the, the men of Lake Town were the ones that made it and uh, they, they would give it to the dwarves because they were so, you know, so friendly with the dwarves right there in um, Erebor. So, I don't know. So it's just one of those things that, um, so it's similar to Lembus, but apparently it doesn't taste like Lembus, especially in the, in the books. I think they really, you know, like they talk about how like yucky it tastes, but it's hearty. <laughs> so it's sustainable. So I didn't get a chance to read the flavor text, so I'll let you do the, do that. But, uh, uh, yeah, you're raising the exact point I was going to. So if you want to know what cram is, I can only say that I don't know the recipe, but it is, biscuitish <laughs> Keep, keeps good indefinitely is supposed to be sustaining and is certainly not entertaining uh being in fact very uninteresting except as a chewing exercise and that's <laughs> out of the hobbit and uh, <laughs> right so those are my favorite parts of the hobbit where J.R. tolkien kind of takes you know removes himself from the as the narrator and kind of talks to the audience as opposed right. you know like as opposed to just recounting the story like that's exactly what he's doing there that's like where he's like i'm going to tell the audience what this is and i'm not just recounting the story <laughs> that's great so and yeah there's the, there's another sentence or something about that and i remember them saying like yeah like it doesn't it doesn't taste good <laughs> yeah but this right. is what we eat on our journey yeah yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think that there's some other uses. I mean, we don't have to go through the the whole the whole of the how to use cram. I mean, if you want to ready a hero and you and you have leadership, one of the one of the things that I have found if I don't have spirit access and I don't have um like a easy way to ready somebody, you know, like I Cram made it back popular for me to use when I was looking in leadership for ways to ready heroes. There's just not a lot of ways to ready heroes that are not, you know, like there's fast hitch for hobbits. There's unexpected courage for anybody, but if you're not running spirit, you know, there's, it's, it's hard to do, you know? So, uh, so that's where this card kind of was like, Oh, let's, come back and 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 start using this so yeah um there's 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 a ton of justifications to ready hero you know look look at um uh, yeah i mentioned galadriel and basically any any of the three wielders of the rings of power right Right. like kirden and gandalf and elrond using vilia all those rings take action or galadriel has her ability plus can use the ring to contribute her willpower so Having them as an extra action is just lets you. It just enables those uh, those rings, and you're going to want to find something else, of course, more consistent. You know, like Light of Valinor. Yes, is really good, and we mentioned Unexpected Courage, and uh, but this is just sort of another option on top of those. And if you're not playing those spheres, you know, if you're even if you're playing uh, leadership and you have a hero like. Uh, we mentioned defenders like Urken Brand, like he's a great target. He's got three defense sentinel to attack. You might just find yourself needing an extra action with him during the combat phase. And you're, you'd be glad to have it. Yeah. And that's, I think that that's like, this is one of those cards that I don't think is a, is a bomb card and doesn't make like, doesn't make a lot of splash, but when you need it, you need it and you use it. And I think once you put it in a, in a deck and you use it, like you're like, Oh, okay. Like, like to discard it to get a ready, I think people, at least me, I can't speak for everybody in the game, but you know, I think it's like ah, you know, I have unexpected courage, I might as well not include cram, but <laughs> it's pretty good. I mean, how many times do you usually? Let me say this: as I think that when you use unexpected courage, you're banking on unexpected courage as part of the the mechanic of your deck. 
Like yes. you you want that you want Baragon to be able to defend twice. Like it's not convenient if you want it to. To you know, it's not one of those things. It's like I need Baragon by round three or four to be able to be defending twice, or else this isn't gonna go well. I think when you're including Cram, you're including Cram as cards in a in a deck that's just like, okay, this is this is my deck. You know, it would be okay maybe if I had an extra ready every once in a while. You know, it's not like mm-hmm. integral to the mechanic of the game. How does this work? Do you think with maybe some of the new uh, contracts? I mean, that's those are the new hotnesses, right? So, yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, I think. Well, I mean, the Council of the Wise, where you're only allowed to include one copy of every card. I think that this should make the cut in that deck a ton. Like. You know what? <laughs> you know, yeah. Like that's if you're looking to right. That's a great point. Council of the Wise. You can only have uh, one card. Um, it, I mean, I know that events are what trigger the Council of the Wise to go, but you mm-hmm. also need other things. You can't do a fifty card event deck, so you need to have right. other things. I I found that when I've run my Council of the Wise, that you know, even just having twenty events kind of get that get that deck up and going. So you need thirty of something else. So I mean, this is this is a great, great option for that. Yeah, uh, I've recently put it into. It's made the cut in a lot of my bond of friendship decks, because in a bond of friendship deck, you only have one hero from each sphere, and so your the the resource cost of each non neutral card tends to be low. I tend not to put anything that costs more than two, um, unless I have some other tricks or resource smoothing or something like that. And cram is a great card because you can just draw it. And then first turn, you're like, okay, I can put it on any one of my four heroes, right? You have four targets for it. Right. And easy to play. Right. It can go in a burglar's turn, I guess. That, that Just between you and me, the burglar <laughs> and our hundreds and hundreds of listeners, between you and me and our, all our listeners, I feel like the burglar's turn is the contract that um, is not as exciting for me to play. I'm just not, you know, even though it can go like it's an item and that's what goes into a burglar's it could, turn. It could be in, in the loot deck, deck. It can right? be in the loot, for right, the loot deck. Right. In a burglar's turn deck, you can't put any attachments. And the only thing that you can put into the loot deck are items and artifacts. Like weapons. And, yeah. Um, I, I think it's items and artifacts. Yeah. I want to say without, right. Without and I think all, all, all uh, weapons are items also. So right. like armor and things like that. So I think that that's, but yeah, it's a bit, it's possible. I said it's a, uh, not an ideal. Ideally you want to pack that deck with, but sometimes with, with expensive cards, guarded cards, but you know, once you start to, once you get that initial list of like eight, nine, 10, you end up kind of filling out the last couple with like some just kind of, <laughs> Right, you know, more mediocre mid cards, and yeah, you know, maybe this this will make your cut right on uh, one of them. Um, I also I found stay- that this is good for. Um, I know it sounds weird because the the gray wanderer deck has um, has built in readying with the mm-hmm. contract, but at the beginning of the game, when you need a ready, <laughs> you know, you can get that with cram if it's a leadership hero or your first non-unique card that you play is leadership and it's cramped like it's it's not a bad option if you're looking for readies you know yeah uh certainly that would then let you use the contract for resources and then healing that turn right so if you have a if you have a scenario and you know first turn uh enemies are you're going to be or you want to deal with an enemy because the encounter deck either starts with one engage with you or uh, starts with some in the staging area as the setup, then yeah, an extra ready is going to likely help you out in that scenario. Yeah. Um, so let me just real quick look up something here. Sure. And I'll say like... Plus, when, when you play it, you can tell other players to cram it. Yeah. You cram it up your cram hole. David, I'm playing this card. It's called cram. <sighs> well, so what cards give you an a non-conditional ready is that 
Does that make sense? Like, oh, sure, sure. You know, um, like, and so, so what I'm saying is that, you know, in terms of, I guess, attachments, because some cards like Core Aragorn can ready themselves. So, mm-hmm. you know, but um, Unexpected Courage, of course, is like the gold standard of readying. Yep. And then there's Fast Hitch, which can ready hobbits, but only ready hobbits. Mm-hmm. Right. And then there's this card cram which can go on to anything right like any hero any hero any hero yeah you know? uh there there are mounts that do readying such as rohan warhorse but those go on that goes on a tactics hero or rohan uh and the armored uh destrier and that goes on a leadership or a sentinel hero right and then there's lembus which goes on a noldor or sylvan hero right uh, on well, Lembus, sort of Lembus goes on any hero, but you need a, a Noldor or Sylvan to play it if okay. to control one. I think. A, right. Um, I don't think it has to be unique either. I can't. Right. I don't think it says unique, but you have to control one, so it could be an ally. Um. So if you don't have one as a hero, but so right. that is it's semi conditional. Right. Yeah, it can go on anybody. I guess as long as you have that, you know, like, I mean, so. Here's here's what I'm looking, and I I just pulled up the list onto um on rings on rings DB. I pulled up the list on um Hallborn, right? And I'm looking at everything that had that's re- attachments that ready. So it's like Wingfoot, Heir of Mardil, Sparehood and Cloak, Steed of the Mark. Here's the funny thing. So Sparehood and Cloak is kind of like the maybe the most like this like everything else that's in this um in this list uh magic ring i guess maybe is readying yep but it's all conditional like you like it it you know so if you're trying to build and so what i mean by conditional is i mean you need a certain trait or you need a certain race you need something where those guys are gonna where you can yeah, the the card like, itself like is restricted wing- to going on a certain traded hero or you need a certain traded hero to play it. Right. And while they are permanent, they're not so that but that makes them not very flexible, right? And so this is one of the very few cards that is flexible but not permanent. Which I think is an important <laughs> it's what I'm really getting at here, right? Yeah. Like you know, like <laughs> I don't know how many times I I don't play armored destrier in my deck because I'm not building leadership decks often with a hero with a or with a sentinel. I'm definitely not as a solo player not playing sentinel on purpose, you know, what I'm saying like mm-hmm. you know, armored destrier is a great card. I mean, I you, you have it in your decks, but I'm not drawn to playing the Ar- armored destrier necessarily. You know, I do play the Rohan Warhorse because the the extra ready there, you know, wing foot and that sort of stuff. I but leather boots, you know. But again, wing foot and leather boots can whiff, right? Cram can't. Uh... Yeah, they they require you to have a certain sphere or a certain trait, right? And then their um, ability to ready is not always guaranteed on those two specific cards, right? So that I guess that that's you know I this is I, yeah, I feel like is a, a guaranteed unconditional ready for nothing. <laughs> it's right. just, it's really simple but effective, right? So we need a we need a fan of the show to come up with um, a, a take on that. Uh, on that song, uh, money for nothing. Get your ready for nothing and your checks for free. <laughs> <laughs> by the Dire Straits. <laughs> we're gonna have a we're gonna have a whole like card talk soundtrack by, by the yes. time we're done. <laughs> Join us. Know? Become a patron. That way, next year when you get your card talk CD, <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna featuring such titles as Ready for Nothing and. Uh, Gone, very gone. Right. Gone, very gone. 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 I don't know who's going to sing them because I can't sing at all. So, Ted, yeah, not me. Okay, Grant. Me. Grant with his with his leaves. tooth, his toothless. Yep. Uh, by uh, by note by by, by his absence. <laughs> yep. Um, he, he's, he's awarded that. <laughs> he's awarded the singing role. 
anyways well yeah i i think we named uh, a lot of really great use cases we named a lot of great heroes that are targets um because pretty pretty much all of them are right any hero that's bent on attacking or defending or has the stats to support questing and then doing either one of those things right this is a great card for yep. so yeah i'm ready i'm ready to ring it unless you have any any uh you can uh, give your final the, thoughts. I was going to say, the, on, the only thing that I can add is just that the artwork on the card still is still, <laughs> um, even though it came out early on in the card, in the game's life cycle, uh, you know, over hill and under hill, it's, uh, it's still, a, I still enjoy looking at this card. Yeah, like, it pretty accurately re reflects it, right? Like, the dwarf is just, he's eating it, and that's it. Like, there, there's no right. other like emotion other than him eating it <laughs> right who and it's one of the dwarves i forget which one has the green cloak is it is it bofer uh, i don't know one of them is like is specific has the green green cloak so i don't know somebody somebody listening this far into the episode tell me who is the one with the green cloak um but that's that's it. The art's the art's really good in this. I like the art. So, Ted, should we ring this guy? Yeah, let's uh, let's cram this guy. Let's cram it. So, for anybody who doesn't know or is new to the show, uh, or may have forgotten, we have a highly scientific yet arbitrary system where we rank cards on a scale from one to ten. Where one is the one card to rule them all, or the best card in the game, and ten is the card that is gets thrown back into the fiery chasm from whence it came or not a very good card. So um, maybe I'll go first. I always put the other guys on the spot and have them go first. So maybe Ted, uh, I will go first. David, would you uh, like to go first in uh, writing this card? I, I would love, I would love to. Thank you. Thank okay. you for allowing me. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I think this is a good card. Um, I like playing it solo, and I think it's got a lot of targets. It doesn't make it into a ton of my decks, but I like it. In like I said, when you need it, you need it. It may not ever get used, but it, you know, having it on a hero and never using it is better than not having it on a hero when you when you actually need it. Um, so, you know, we went through how it's. I, pr I probably belabored the point too much, you know, but the fact that it's non-conditional but not permanent i think is the the big drawback but i don't think it's that huge of a drawback but again when i compare it to unexpected courage and some of those other things i think that those are mechanical to a deck this is not necessarily mechanical to a deck i think you build around you don't build around unexpected courage but like you include leather boots in a deck for a specific reason this mm -hmm. you 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 don't put into a deck for specific reasons. You put it into a deck because you just want the ready. So having said all of that, I think that this card gets a four in my book. So, Ted, what do you think? Very good. Uh, yeah, that's a great point. I, I think, for example, when you include a card like Light of Valinor, which is similar to a ready, right? It lets a Noldor or Sylvan quest without exhausting, right? It's, it's giving you another action, questing and another action to do later in the round, but you build your deck around that. You're like, okay, I'm going to put Light of Valinor on Elrond or on Glorfindel or on Cirdan. Um, So yeah, this all around, it's a great card and uh, I'm glad to have it when it's in play. And like I said before, early on, when you lose it, you're not hurt, right? If you play your first turn Light of Valinor and the first shadow card is discard an attachment you control, it's just, you know, it hurts. You're like, oh, no, this was part of my deck plan. But to lose that cram, you're like, eh, easy come, easy go. So I'm going to give it a five because it's, you know, it's just a not an entertaining card as the flavor text says. <laughs> it's so, <laughs> it's like, just... the card itself is so, because it's so bland of a card, <laughs> which is exactly what it is in right. the lore. Right. It's just it's a bland, sustaining food, and that's exactly what it does in the game, right. like spot on. And so, it really, and when you need it, you need it. But when you know, like hungry, that's really funny. So, 
Okay, well, everybody, uh, that was our card cram. And join us again as we talk about more cards in the game. Have a great day, everybody. Do you love the content? Here's what you can do to stay connected. Become a patron. The money collected through Patreon goes into keeping the lights on here at the podcast. We love our patrons, and you can join at many different levels. Visit patreon.com slash cardtalk2018. You can subscribe to us, whether you're watching our YouTube channel or you're listening to us in your favorite podcatcher. Hit the subscribe button to get notifications of all our new episodes. Didn't know we were an audio podcast? Find us by searching Card Talk to get access to our 120 plus regular episodes. Didn't know we were a video channel? Find us by searching Card Talk L O T R L C G on YouTube. And there you can find not only our regular episodes, but you can find our bonus playthroughs and other content related to the game. Want to get a hold of Ted, Grant, or myself? Feel free to email the podcast at cardtalk2018 at gmail.com.